And posture can be surprisingly important. Sitting in a way that strengthens the energy for practice. And balancing that effort with the right amount of ease so that practice also feels restful. And you can check right from the beginning, what is it like? Does this feel like rest? Remembering that we don't have to do anything, just invite rest. You can see how the spine provides the skeletal support. We can move even just millimeters can make the right adjustment to allow the spine to do its work without any ever other extra efforting. See if we can find that ease in the way the head, the neck is aligned. Again, sometimes just a millimeter or two of an adjustment. We can feel that nice ease right there. Oh yeah, right there. Right there, there's not that much effort. There's more rest here. And then with that nice spinal alignment, back, neck, head, The rib cage has the capacity to be open. And sometimes there can be a felt sense of vulnerability in the posture. Just reminding ourselves that we're safe right here. It's safe to be intimate. It's safe enough to practice. So with the spine and alignment and the rib cage, 
relatively open, the shoulders naturally fall where they do, the belly has space, the organs have space. The breath now has room. The breath nourishing the body. This combination of strength, support of the spine and softness, openness of the belly and chest, extending all the way from the tailbone to the top of the head. And even if it's slight, see if you can notice the ease in the system. And this nice feeling that comes with accepting the body as it is, accepting the conditions as they are, and doing what we can do to support our own well being. Perhaps awareness steadies. The heart feels less burdened.
breath by breath. this process connecting is really trustworthy. And yet, the system with its defensiveness will resist this vulnerability. And so when that happens, no problem. Just include that resistance in this natural process of connecting. And continue.
And when you're ready, opening your eyes. Thank you for your practice. I'm wondering how you're feeling now after that sitting period. If anybody wants to write a word or two or three in the chat, it would be cool. Thanks for your honesty. Hmm. It's uh, so nice to feel some connection even. Yeah, I'm, I'm consistently sort of awed by both my dissatisfaction and appreciation of technology. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so we're always invited to bring all of us to our practice and to the room, our experience, our identities, And I don't know about you, but sometimes just the question like, um, how was practice or how was practice? There can be so much that comes with the, the inquiry, especially in a room full of other meditators. We've, be we've um, last week we began an uh, exploration of samadhi if you're following along in the book, Listening to the Heart, uh, the book that Kitty Saro and Tanessa Russ, two wonderful teachers, wrote, you can still order online if you want, but we're posting the chapters um, as we go along together on the website. So you can go there and we're delving into chapter three now for a few more weeks. And in this chapter, um, called uh, The Steady Heart, I think, the title. We really um, start to take a look at samadhi practice. And if you've been practicing for a little while, you don't even need to be practicing that long, but samadhi is, a, is an integral part of our practice. And so you might hear teachers talk about samadhi and describe samadhi. And our relationship to samadhi can be quite com complicated. So that feeling of like, I need to perform, I need to get it right. I'll speak up a little bit. Um, your voice might be a bit soft. So I'm feeling relaxed. And I was just saying that even in a simple question of how's practice, all of our 
kind of neurotic tendencies towards being good enough might show up. And this tends to, for me, uh, in my experience, both practicing and sharing the Dhamma, um, it seems to be true for many people that this idea of samadhi or this practice of samadhi can bring with it a whole lot of judgment. Yeah, often uh, samadhi can be described as concentration, but there are many ways to describe samadhi. And so we're, we're, we'll explore some of the uh, different ways to experience samadhi over the next few weeks together. But the idea of concentration kind of brings with it this, I need to be focused. And also if there's, if, if this mind isn't clear and connected moment by moment by moment in a concentrated way, like on the breath, for example, if the mind gets lost and thought or something like that, it can feel like a failure. Matthew Brinsilver sometimes describes the, you know, head droopy, shameful walk back to the breath once we've been lost in thought, which I can really resonate with like, ah, oh, failed. But that's not a supportive view of this beautiful and connecting energy. Energy is this really gathered mind, body, energy that can support our practice. Kitty Sarrell describes samadhi like this. In samadhi, the energies of body, speech, and mind are suffused with awareness and become unified. So our essential question to answer perhaps is, what is samadhi? How do I know it? What's it like in my life? And how is it relevant at a time like this? At a time like this, when there's a lot moving in our hearts and in the world. And I don't need to continue to name all the ways that uh, this is com our life is complicated right now, but, but we know what they are. We're asked to do so much. And at a time when you know, there's a lot of emotion flowing through the heart and ways of relating to that emotion that feel sometimes skillful and sometimes not. Perhaps sometimes we feel depressed and unmotivated and other times anxious and unfocused, hopeless, confused. These are some of the experiences that are pretty common for all human beings right now, especially those of us living in the United States, but not just in the United States. The global predicament that we're in is challenging to relate to in skillful ways with any kind of consistency. So when I think of samadhi, you know, just... I've been exploring samadhi. It's been such a useful thing to do. I've actually really appreciated it um, as a fo practice focus over the last few weeks. So I've just, you know, go right back to the basics. Sometimes like what? Letting go all of the kind of conceptual understanding and framework, intellectual framework that I've had or even previous experiences with samadhi and just really land in the present moment. So what's the experience of a heart, mind, body that is gathered or unified, the energies that are gathered or unified? And that could be a useful question as a starting point for us as we start to know, start to understand, right? What is it like when the energy of this whole constitution feels like it's gathering. It's, ga it's in the process of gathering. It's in the process of unifying. And it could be like a unification that feels like it's collecting on a particular experience like the breath, or maybe it's more global than that. But you get to, you get to explore that territory. 
And as I've been exploring this territory, these um, what has come forward for me is how close samadhi is related to faith, confidence, vulnerability, trust, ease, and this deep, deep, deep resting, along with deep listening. In samadhi, the energies of body, speech, and mind are suffused with awareness and, became, and become unified. So through this process of unification, of gathering together the energies of heart and body, the system actually taps into a great mystery of our humanness. And perhaps it calls us to move beyond our conceptual realm to feel the full impact, the full profound impact of this natural process when we practice, when we care about intimacy, when we care about being connected, being in, being fully in our, our lives. And some of this is hard to put into words, which is why I'm encouraging us to move beyond the conceptual, at least for a fuller understanding. It's not that we have to get rid of or somehow demonize the conceptual world or the intellectual world, or even the, the teachings that the ways that we've learned previously, but we just want to see if we can explore in a full way that um, welcomes all ways of knowing. So employing the whole system, all of our resources, all of the ways into uh, tapping into the depth of knowing. And so just to name some of those experiences that might come natural to you actually, you know, in, in um, the dominant ways of understanding are often in the conceptual realm, especially um, in the Western world, where we highly value intellect. It's one of the aspects of white supremacy culture, actually, this overvaluing of intellectual understanding and undervaluing of other ways of knowing. So one of, so one of the things that we can do as we explore a full understanding of samadhi is kind of re, um, uh, reminding ourselves of this belonging, right? That is more expansive than just what the intellectual mind can, can come up with. A sense of belonging that um, is willing to see what's been lost right? within our systems of domination. So ways of knowing could be through language or sense perception, emotion. Some of us might be really tapped into emotional, um, the emotional um, sensitivity that might give us clues into some deeper knowing. Intuition, you know, sometimes the system will, there will be some knowing in the system but that it doesn't have a location. But yet it feels strong. There's a strong confidence that's there. Like, oh yeah, this is, this feels right. This feels accurate. This feels true. Storytelling, observing nature, being a part of nature, feeling connected to earth feeling a part of the, this body, understanding how this body is a, um, a force of the elements, much in the way that weather is a force of elements and growth and death in nature are all just very similar experiences. And then we can often know through our relationships communally, can get a sense of 
deep truth, deep presence, deep intimacy. We can taste, we can taste it through our relational field. And as we welcome all of these ways of knowing, we can also remember, which is really important to remember, that the Buddha, again, wasn't interested in some kind of attainment. So often this limited, not wrong, but this limited view of uh, samadhi as a um, concentration only practice, right? Which is, it's not wrong to say that samadhi, uh, it's not wrong to describe samadhi as concentration, but we're just broadening our view because we're interested in knowing how it's relevant, how this practice of samadhi is relevant in this time in the context of our daily lives. So we want to remember that the Buddha wasn't interested in attaining a deep state of concentration um, in and of itself. He wasn't interested in attainments in and of themselves. He was interested in this process of awakening and the role that samadhi plays in our capacity for liberation. So the Buddha was interested in suffering and the end of suffering, One could, what contributes to suffering and what supports freedom, ease, intimacy, connection. The samadhi and engaging process of gathering the energies of mind and body to understand deeply how suffering is created and what leads to letting go. This is the role of samadhi in our lives. So how is it relevant? Well, we might think about this um, gathering of energies as a force, right? That, and, and every energy has a force. All of the energies that we can know and understand have a force. And this is per, perhaps the first uh, window into the power of samadhi, just understanding the force of energy, right? And so we might just, you know, as an exploration, just feel into energy as we have it, as when it's strong, when it's not that strong, as it relates to some of the common human experiences, like the emotional experiences. We might just get interested as an exploration, like, okay, what is, what is energy and how do I feel it? Where do I know it? How do I feel the force of it? How do I feel as diminishing qualities when low energy states are there. So the mind can gather energy for its useful, for its use, right? For, and that gathering of energy can be supportive or it can be not supportive. It can be in line with the end of suffering helping us, or it can be used um, in unskillful ways. So some just common examples to help us get connected with energy, you might um, know some of this, if, especially if you are a creative person and do anything creative or artistic, like painting or drawing or playing music, or sometimes reading or writing, cooking, gardening, common ways of expressing your creativity, dancing. You might notice the energy in the heart mind that connects with the energy of the body and expresses itself through these different means, these creative outlets. And we might call those like really useful rebalancing skillful means in our lives. And then the energy of greed, for example, like as a, um, a force of what's perhaps not useful in our lives. So the force of greed that, um, greed that re uh, manifests in terms of addiction 
or addictive tendencies. So it could be substance, it could just be the compulsiveness of cons consuming, buying, watching, reading, as a kind of neurotic need to uh, devour something, right? Something that this energy that calls us to look for happiness in something else. Or an example of an energy, another energy that's often not skillful is the use of anger. Now, I, I have different ideas of anger. I've been exploring anger for uh, quite a long time uh, because I have been curious about the energy. And so, not to, again, not to, not to say that there's no use for the energy that we might say we might call anger, but it's a, volat it's a volatile energy. So it's one that can be really, that can really sweep us off our feet. And if you've ever been swept away by anger, if you've ever felt angry and you can you know how sharp it is that in a in a second anger can take us for a ride right and then we're saying something or doing something that we regret all because anger was so strong it it flooded the heart without our knowing without the strength of awareness accompanying it and it just did what it does So this understanding of energy can help us understand how systems of domination, again, have been perpetuated, gathering the, the mind around an idea and kind of getting fixated on an idea and not, and an inability to see, uh, to see beyond it, to understand the force, right? That's, that's fueling the action related and if we don't understand what is happening in the mind and be able to feel the impact of these gathered forces, these gathered energetic forces, we'll just swim in delusion. We'll act out domination. We'll act out unhealthy states individually and collectively because we don't understand the processes of mind at work. So we can sort of begin um, an exploration of samadhi with, you know, this understanding of what might be an unhealthy relationship, striving to attain something, um, and we can combine that with this understanding, this kind of striving energy to attain something and understand the forces, uh, the energetic forces that are alive in our hearts and minds and our constitutions. And this capacity to gather that energy, right? This natural capacity that this mind has that will, it will happen whether we like it or not, right? Whether we are aware, whether this is just what the mind will do, energy comes, it, collects and we can support uh, skillful ways of, of understanding and doing that. So one of the ways to sort of use the energies that are here and available to us is like with our compassion practice or a metta practice or loving kindness practice or by giving our minds something useful to do with its energetic forces, giving our hearts something to do. So if you've ever been in a funk, <clears throat> I'm sure I'm the only one that gets in a funk from time to time or, or, or more often than that. <laughs> what can be useful is just giving the mind a job, like, okay, you know, this, this mind tends to lean towards aversive tendencies. So it can just start to feel cranky and notice everywhere the glass is half full, or half, no, half empty, that would be the other way. And so just noticing like, okay, I'm just gonna see if I can notice 
all the ways that I'm grateful to be alive, right? Or all the people, all the connections in my life that are rich and useful. And in the beginning of that exploration, it's not, it doesn't feel that natural because there's this kind of cranky energy that's there, right? But as the mind starts to do something with that energy that's useful, it becomes more natural. So this is where the, the beautiful mystery um, can be felt. If you've ever, if you've done, like started an exercise habit, like I, I've been a runner off and on throughout my life, um, it's like in the beginning of your exercise routine, it takes some effort to get going, right? And the first, the first for me, like the first 10 minutes of a run aren't quite that pleasant because the body is getting used to doing what it knows how to do and the mind is really not quite there yet. But with a little bit of effort and that direction, direction, we're gonna do this, then something really lovely happens. The practice just kind of starts to do itself. Like the run just starts to do itself. And the mind follows along and it becomes a lot more easy. It almost feels natural, right? So if you jump on the treadmill or you jump on the elliptical or you go out for a walk, it may not be that fun to get going. But once you get going, you're like, okay, just walking, right? The heart has accepted this activity. The body knows what it's doing. And there's a kind of momentum that, ha that happens. So the practice is just the energy has gathered and it's just kind of propelling us along. So we're in the flow in that, in those moments. So giving the mind something to do and using that uh, practice that we've chosen, like the practice of gratitude, um, or the practice of remembering what one is grateful for. And then watching the mind as it gets used to that activity, some momentum develops and it becomes easier and more natural, a kind of ease develops and even uh, a pleasant happiness can be there. In one of the ancient texts of Vasudhimaga, it said that Happiness is the proximate cause for samadhi. Happiness is the proximate cause for samadhi. So as the system starts to relax, right, we maybe have, we maybe saw this in our meditation practice earlier, that it takes a little effort to sit down, to get situated, to choose a posture, to accept this activity that we're engaging in, this activity of sitting practice. And then as the energy settles, collects and settles, it becomes a little more easeful and there's a little, it's pleasant. That feeling of connection, that feeling of presence is actually pleasant. And it's with that pleasant feeling that this practice just starts to flow, it starts to do itself, just like the run might do itself, just like the gratitude practice might do itself. It doesn't take as much effort because there's this habit that's developed, this habit of using the energies that are there for something that's
Just like that, test of samadhi. Perfectly timed Zoom, thank you. So one of the other traps or uh, perhaps uh, ways that we can uh, relate to samadhi that's not that helpful for us is to sort of demonize the thinking mind, right? We might have this idea that if we're really concentrated, then we're not thinking. And although it can be true that the thinking mind can sort of uh, the energies aren't so much needed for thinking because there's this relaxed, connected, suffused energy of mind and body that the energies don't need to go to the thinking as much anymore. So we can see it like a relaxation of the thinking mind. It's not that useful for us to try to not think. It'd be like to try to not hear or to try to not see if our eyes were open or if our ears were functional. But we can recognize when the energies are fragmented and we can give the mind something to do to support it, right? So like chanting is a really good, can be a, a really useful thing to do. Um, Often, I will like have a, a supportive chant in mind if, if I need it. It can be while I'm feeling particularly scattered or fragmented. I might bring to mind the compassion chant, something very simple. I give my life to the one who hears the cries of the world and just repeat that again in my mind, again and again and again, again. Or maybe there's a nice song. I woke up a couple mornings ago and felt just um, not that present. And so I remembered getting this text from someone in my cohort with a, um, a version of infinity song and I sent it to Gabe because I loved it and I thought Gabe would appreciate it. But it's a, a remake of an old Beachy song, How Deep Is Your Love? I would, I would encourage you to go find it. How Deep Is Your Love by this family band called Infinity Song and it's so lovely. And so I just found myself like, I don't even know all the words to the song, but it really does give this heart something useful to do with its energy when it just wants to complain or be unhappy or, you know, be lost in the future, lost in the past, or complaining about the past, feeling hope, hopeless or worried about the future. Like, okay, right now, let's give you a good, let's give you a job. So we're gonna use the thinking mind well, give it a job, help the energy gather in a really useful way to support my well being, And we can do this. Right? It doesn't, it's not that sophisticated. Give ourselves a mantra, a simple chant, remember a song, and watch the mind brighten with that. Watch the energy settle and feel the ease, right? Because we don't want to think that it's because of the song, actually, but want to see that it's because of the processes of gathering, of finding a useful way to gather the energy. And there can be non-useful ways of thinking too. So like rumination is a, an element of depression, you know, like depression and anxiety, rumination. And so if we notice the mind spinning, 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 and it's ruminating, that would be an unskillful use of the think, you know, an unskillful use of the thinking mind and not actually something that we're, we know that we have some say over. 
right? Often it's just happening. And then we catch it every once in a while and we catch it every once in a while and don't know what to do. So lots of ways to help this, the energy gather and collect in some, some of the ways that we know, you know, like doing some sitting practice, taking a, a mindful walk, spending some time in nature, doing some chanting, remembering a song, all good ways um, to give the mind something to do. So it's not left to his own um, neurotic devices. And it's also good to remember that we can't control what we experience. Right. So like this, yes, we do have some say, we do have some responsibility to influence the conditions that will offer us a fighting chance of responding skillfully to our, you know, the movement of our own heart and our relationships and our collective realities. And we can't, we don't have any say over how nature flows, right? We might sit down with the best of intentions and the heart is so all over the place, right? The mind is just not doing anything that we want it to do, right? Thinking, getting lost in thought and body restless, feeling, you know, not so great. And that's just the way it is for us. So we have to remember that we we don't have control, but we have responsibility and we can, we have some influence. So our effort to influence and also that responsibility to surrender. And this, you might have felt that in the meditation. I, I felt it, that spine that is really supports us. gives us some influence, like right there, whew, grounded, rooted, and the chest that opens and the belly, that there's some vulnerability just in the posture. So we might find that even as soon as we begin to practice, even with the intention to be present, we might find like, oh, it's so, it feels so vulnerable, right? As the system starts to relax, that there's a vulnerability that's there. This, we're not fighting, we're not bracing, we're purposefully inviting the system to set all that down, set down all of the control and just receive. Receive what's moving in the heart in any moment. Emotion, body sensation, thought. So whatever wants to be here gets to be here. There's no stopping it anyway. That's just more causing more suffering to try to control experience. So we have some influence, but we can't control. And in that remembering that we're not here to try to control, we actually, that energy that goes to trying to control is freed up and can be used can be used skillfully. So as that energy is available to us, the real questions emerge that are needed, like, can I tolerate this? Can I be here with this? Can I be here with what's moving in my heart and what's moving in your heart? Can I be in relationship right now to other humans? Can I accept this world just the way it is, this world that we've co-created together? Right, there's a difference there in our relationship to experience. It is painful to hate and want to control something that is just a natural force. We can know our own hearts this way, we can know each other's hearts this way, and we can know all the movement in the world this way. We can know the systems and the institutional forces, right, that have been influenced by history. Again, naming white supremacy as an example of that. The historical underpinnings have been there since the beginning of this country's existence. So instead of aiming to control 
actually accepting with a lot of vulnerability and ease the reality like oh this is the way it is can i feel into the vulnerability of not having any control but accepting the responsibility can i feel into that fully accepting fully surrendering to the way it is taking responsibility for it right for having some influence But ex and accepting like, oh, I don't, I can't, con I'm not control, I'm not in control. Just like the run will start to do itself and the gratitude practice will start to do itself, the momentums that have been seeded in our in the collective, you know, in the institutions, for will continue to move. So, what do we want to do with that? Is the question, right? And we'll have a better, we'll have a better chance of responding with our full capacity and strength if we can really let go. And you can test this out for yourself in your own individual practice. See what kind of energy is there when the system surrenders, when it and when at least to some extent, some of the neurotic habits start to diminish. And you can practice this in, in places where you feel, where you feel, you know, uh, some ease. This is why going on retreat makes so much sense because we get to really taste the value of Samadhi. If it's a half a day or full day or longer, a week, a month or longer, in the context of retreat practice, the system tends to know, get used to that process of settling. And we can start to see the energy that's there, the capacity, that the strength, the resiliency that emerges in that settling process, which only supports faith and confidence for me, hopefully for us, in this exploration in our daily life. Like, oh, how does samadhi make sense here? When I'm not on retreat, when the world's a mess, when my heart's a mess, when my relationship's a mess, how does it make sense to continue to practice and use this natural tendency of the heart to gather and collect, unify, and drop its neurotic tendencies? to support the, to, for good use in my life, for my own benefit, for your benefit, for our benefit. It's like in daily life, it's a bit, harder for us to feel the full force of the strength of samadhi because the mind you know part of the description of samadhi can be the unhindered mind the mind that has dropped its neurotic habits at least diminished the neurotic habits of mind have diminished it's not quite as much doubt not quite as much fighting not quite as much grasping not quite as much apathy And a lot of times, to be honest, in our daily life, there's some, some element of a hindrance that's flowing through the mind. So we have to accept that as a truth and just work with it because it's not impossible. We just have to get creative and broaden our view. Oh, okay. Going back to that original description by Kitty Saro. In samadhi, the energies of body, speech, and mind are suffused with awareness and become unified. Okay, so we need mindfulness. We need some connection, some intimacy, some gathering of energy. Heart, body, mind. We're going to employ all our resources. So we're going to move beyond the conceptual. We're going to feel into the body. 
We're going to use our intuition, our connection with the earth, other human beings to try to understand what this means to have a heart that can be suffused in this way. Some of you come to the Tuesday night conversations, started this new program a couple months ago called the Dhamma Among Us. And uh, it was a means for some of my friends and the IMS community through the teacher training that we're nearing the end of um, a way for us to teach together, share the Dhamma together and really learn from each other just and, and so it's, it's open to anybody and anybody can come Tuesday night. And what we do is just show up and have a conversation as something new emerges every week. So a couple of us from the training cohort show up and agree to lead. And we may have a theme in mind, but not, more, not, not a whole lot more than that. And I wasn't even sure, like, when we started this, I felt a little embarrassed about saying that. I was interested in the experimental nature of it, but realizing that this kind of a, against the stream in our Dharma world to trust emergence. But last night, it, you know, and, and each week, it's such a beautiful, it's such a beautiful um, and sort of corrective emotional experience to to set down all in moments to actually the, watch the system set down its need to be good or right or perfect you know these, these ideas that especially in this white-bodied experience I've just breathed in over time and just connect with another human being and trust that what emerges between us is really going to be beautiful and it always is. And last night was no exception. And so in the relational field, we can actually see how uh, setting down, and I can feel the tension sometimes, like, oh, what's going to happen next? You know, who's going to talk? Where's it going to go? People don't know what to expect. It's going to be rough. And yet feeling that letting go, oh, don't need to do that. Sweetie, don't need to do that. And that process of shedding moment by moment by moment is so, uh, there's so much energy in the heart to actually be right there and to watch, to pay attention. Like, oh, not sure. Oh, that happened. And watch how this wisdom, this compassion connects up with the compassion and wisdom that moves through another felt experience, another lived experience of another human being. It's so sweet, right? So right here in the relational field, we can feel the power of samadhi practice. So I hope you get jazzed about exploring a little bit over the next week. And uh, feel, feel really always welcome to bring your explorations back to the room here when we're together on Wednesday nights. And even throughout the program, you're welcome to write things in the chat and always save a little bit of time for questions some, some weeks longer. I didn't save that much time tonight, so perhaps next week I'll save a little bit more time for your reflections alongside of mine. But if anybody has anything um, to add, please feel welcome to, to speak it into the space. Hmm. I'm just appreciating Ashley's comment here in the chat that about, um, she says, this resonates. I think I've been trying to control my practice lately, striving for 
perfection and inevitably inevitably feeling like I'm feel like failing when I fail to measure up to where I hope to be. Yeah, I can relate. I feel a sigh of relief in hearing you speak about receptivity and surrendering. Yeah. Thanks, Shelley. Um, yeah, I'll just share kind of a half formed thought, but it's it's been a sort of a practice theme just in the last few days. Um, and it's, I think it ties into what you're sharing. Basically, it's letting go um, as, as a practice um, instruction or invitation. Um, and it's, and I sometimes tune into it by just tuning into my body and you know, like hands and where they're they're holding in another way is just the mind that wants wants direction of any kind and just noticing kind of how that's sort of been this almost um ubiquitous ubiquitous obsession all the time like you need like where's the like directing the mind to this or to that like so just and instead of like well don't direct it to that direct it to this when i notice that and i have you know the space yeah it's like relaxing that muscle and it's kind of scary like it sort of feels like i'm going to float off into nowhere land mm -hmm. and, I, and i wonder how much of it at least in particular these days is like just related to being on the computer so much it's like attention i think our attention those of us who are on computers a lot is in a different is just at a, at a different speed and we're and it's very directed like we really need to put our minds to something um in that way so yeah both kind of physically but also just kind of releasing that um ground of having a clue about anything it's felt like a really supportive practice so i thought i'd just share that mm. yeah thanks gabe There's so many beautiful and creative ways to feel into letting go. Yeah. It's like my favorite thing about practice is it just gets to be a big yes, like everything. What does it mean to let go? In all the ways that, you know, I use my heart and body to engage and move and act and work and play and what does it mean to let go and support that time for another one maybe one more before we close just you know, doing different things like using song and mantra and chanting and creative outlets is good for our, good for us because it engages our whole brain, right? And actually balances the mind and helps us tap into different ways of knowing. You know, like we can feel uh, art is just really a, uh, has a very important place, I think, in in our lives and in social movements and um, just in our our own ability to connect and be intimate so helps us learn how to employ all of our resources again our intuition our felt sense the body you know as we feel into the words of a song or the beautiful music that we appreciate or whatever it is the smell of the food that we're cooking, the delight in the little flowers that are popping out of the ground. Yeah. 
All right. Well, it's time to say goodbye and let go of the words together. Thank you for your practice and may it uh, continue to flow in ways that are unimaginable. And may our practice support all beings without exception. Thank you.